The Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and Pharaoh Show. And you're watching the Monty and Pharaoh Show. Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. And Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh, is it Monty and the Pharaoh? Yeah. Monty and Pharaoh. Dad. The Monty and the Pharaoh show. Monty and the Pharaoh. You've got the future Hall of Famer, that rocker, Marty Gennetti, and MJ in the house, and I'm sitting here with two more future Hall of Famers, Monty and the Pharaoh. We're doing that stuff, and we're going to rock it. Welcome back to a special Friday edition of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty DeFaro, seen only here in Huntington Station, New York, live from Rockstar Studios. At the board is none other than the super producer, Mr. <laughs> Stephen Miller. Hey, we had a glitch already. I insulted one of the guests. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out later we splat you against the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to don't the right... Do it. Don't do it. <laughs> To the right is the star of the show, Jimmy Farrow. Jimmy. Good afternoon. Back again. And we got a special band here, uh, Bart from Wisteria Hall oh. and the infamous Mr. J.J. McGuire. Welcome, guys. They'll be the band for this uh, five-hour marathon we got going Wait. on. Little riff there, Mr. McGuire. <laughs> And our guest of honor, Road Warrior Animal. Yeah, get it right, Animal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, pretty hard for Hawk to be here. Could it be shredding? Bro, <laughs> hey, that introduction was awesome. I hear you hear Janetti. Did I hear the franchise? Yes, you did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man, that was awesome to hear some of those guys. Man. And we're going to add you to that list once we're done. Damn yeah. right you are. And Michael Elgin, man. Michael, thank you for joining us. Oh, buddy. no, thank you very much thank for having you. me. Now, these, my friend, are professional wrestlers. Yes, Look sir. at the size of these two guys. Yes. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. I'm a twerp. I'm a twerp. Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> so let's get it. We got we got an uh, older generation, younger generation. We do a little nice. combo interview here. Usually we nice. go over... All your acc accolades yeah. and everything you've done. We might Obviously, be here for weeks, though. Animal, yeah. uh, forget it. The list is too long. We're right out of time. <laughs> Lord. And Michael, you're an up and comer, and you get you're making moves, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know we'll get into the old uh, Tessa Blanchard thing and everything else. But uh, listen, I want to start off with Animal. Yes. A little problem oh. with Becky Lynch. A little old, old news, but what's the deal with there? What what was you, going you on? You know, man. Uh, at first, when they came out with the man thing. Brother just dropped his guitar. Guitar, yeah. Dang, I thought I thought I was gonna have to do the, you know, he, he, he helped write the song with Jimmy Hart, you know. There's gonna be a rumble tonight. Remember Hawk and I did that thing, man. Yeah. It was horrendous, but we loved doing it. I mean, Jimmy's a great. I think guy. the honky tonk man might be here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Someone's gonna get smashed in the head with a guitar. So no, Becky, man, but Becky there Lynch. wasn't a lot of heat with Becky. I just said, I you know, it's funny how the wrestling fans get so offended now. You know, it's the younger generation fan, you know what I mean? I, I wasn't a dig if they listened to the whole thing I did on my podcast. You know, I said that she's a phenomenal wrestler. But you don't hear any of that part, right? Yeah. yeah. All you heard is I said I didn't like the man. And I didn't like the man thing because you're, you're getting ready to do evolution. My thought press, process was, right, why not call him the woman? Because you're there, the you listen, women's wrestling has come a long way, absolutely. You yeah. mentioned Tessa Blanchard, man, one of the best, Great. if not the best female wrestlers, one of the best, right? 
You know, and you have Becky, who's right up there, too, along with Charlotte Flair, you know, and Asuka, you know. And I'm saying, man, put the girl over. Let it be a woman thing. You know, and the, and the man thing's getting over now. Right. I mean, it's like anything, man. Hey, nobody liked Hawk Island when we first came out. Really? Well, no. You know, oh, two big muscle heads. We're not going to let them get anything in this business. But the fans ended up liking the bad boys, and mm-hmm. they ended up being the good guys. And then we just were like, bang, like, you know, gangbusters, right? And people now have come accustomed to the man thing with Becky. You know, I, listen, it was just my opinion, people. People, you know, opinions like buttholes. Everybody's got one. Right. Right? So you're allowed to give your opinion on something. That's all it was, man. I have nothing against Becky. I've taken pictures with her and Seth Rollins at Comic-Cons and stuff. They're two great... You know, it's one thing in our business when you're on TV, but when you get to meet someone behind the scenes, mm. you see how much respect they have for guys and girls that have paved the way for them to have a job. That part is freaking awesome, and they both were cool human beings. What did your brother John think about the comments? Did you hear from him? Like, oh, oh no, I don't ever talk to my brother. Oh, really? No, I, I, you know, okay. Johnny and I don't talk a lot. But you can tell if you put Johnny and I next to each other, you really wouldn't even know we were brothers. I mean, we look way different. And uh, I look more like my brother Mark. I don't know if you guys know my brother Mark was one of the Wrecking Crew of Terminators, mm-hmm. right. Rage and Fury. And he and I look more alike, you know. But my brother Johnny, man, you know, Johnny, um, how can I say this politically? I was one of the boys. Johnny was an office guy. Okay. Total office guy, you know. So it's really hard. I love him to death. He's my brother. People power? People, bro, people power was over, right? I oh, mean, yeah. people power had, had, you know, he had more heat than any of the heels <laughs> in the company, power, right? Yeah. One time. You want to like, we should have taken that yellow freaking suit he wore, that red yeah. jumpsuit he wore, yeah. the wrestling ring. Oh, holy It was great, but that, that's why they yanked him off the TV because he was getting too hot mm. as a heel. Mm-hmm. But, you know, listen, both my brother John and Mark, I got them the breaks in Japan. I opened that door and I said, hey, man, what you do with this thing, you, you got to take it. I can't run with it with you over here. You got to do it. Right. Johnny succeeded very well. Right. And then he had a job with WCW. Then got picked up by WWE. And, you know, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't talk to him as much as I should. You know, listen, he's got his own new life now with me. I'm married. He's in with the Bellas thing, you yeah. know, and everybody yeah. there. He married the Bellas mom and yep. stuff. So, you know, he's got his own thing going on. He's a grandfather now. So it, it's good for him. Cool. Yeah, that was, that was going to be my question. So you actually got into the business first and then got that your brothers into the business. Yeah, I, I was in the business probably for about two or three years. My brothers were going to school at Mankato State University in Minnesota. Right. And when they got out, they said, hey, we want to do the wrestling camp. And uh, I don't even know if you want to know this. I paid Nelson Royal, who ran a camp for Jim Crocker Promotions out there in North Carolina. I sent them through camp. Okay. And then out of that, uh, Baba, Giant Baba, approached me and Hawk and we had an idea because the Japanese are very in the family. He said, what do we do this family tag team deal, you know? So they had John and I and and um, Mark and Hawk, my brother Mark and Hawk, you know, all tagging together. And they did a big family thing, you know, all the magazines were taking pictures of it and stuff. And I got over pretty big. So I said, here's the door, man. You know, you know, Michael tell you that door in Japan it opens up this crack here. You got to be able to fit through that crack and take advantage of your opportunity. Oops! <laughs> Must have been Hawk. <laughs> damn Hawk! Yeah, damn Hawk, right? No, but uh, but you know, and John took advantage of it. And, you know, he Johnny was a smart guy, business wise, for the office. Got in good with Mrs. Baba. Mm-hmm. Got in good with Giant Baba, and. Uh, then he became Booker over there. It doesn't hurt when you're tagging with Stan Hansen or mm. or he or you know uh, or what or Dory Funk or Terry Funk either, man. You know what I mean? Or Steve Williams at the time, you know, Doctor Steve Williams. So all those guys were so hot, and Johnny was their partner. You know, wrestling with a bunch of the top Japanese boys. You know, so Mike, how about you getting into the business? And and I also wanted to ask you was. Fellas like the man sitting next to you, like one of your influ- influences. Like yeah, you know what? We were actually talking because uh, we we came in on the same flight, and uh, I started when I was fourteen. Actually, I found a wrestling school when I was fourteen. They would allow me to train, and it was just always something I wanted to do. But growing up at that time, I run a wrestling school in St. Louis, and I find everybody's much smaller in the sense of like their weight, you know, and the gym isn't as predominant. And I feel like it's just a, a a shift change. So when I was 14, wanting to become a wrestler, the wrestlers I grew up watching were 
you know, Animal and right. Rock and Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior and all these guys that were larger than life, muscular. So to me, when I was thinking about being a pro wrestler, going to the gym was just as important as being in the ring training. Yeah, sure. And I find that now, you know, somebody at 15 wanting to become a wrestler is watching much smaller people wrestle so like that isn't as predominant so guys like animal here were like a huge influence to me one because of the stature and two because my main goal when i started wrestling was actually to compete in japan like that was the one thing i really wanted to accomplish that's so, your favorite place yeah you know um i had a very weird upbringing in the wrestling world and what i mean by that is in canada we only got wwf that was it so my friend got a satellite dish and he got WCW for the first time. And it was Great American Bash 1992. And they had Hase and Hashimoto as a tag team in the tag team title tournament. And then Dr. Dusty Williams and Terry Gordy. Mm. And to me, it was just looked so much different than what I was watching, you know? Early 90s WWF, you had all these over the top characters. And uh, when you watch something like Terry Gordy and, and like Dr. Dusty Williams, you realize how much different the wrestling mm -hmm. looks. And to me, it just looked like, how oh much my is, God, this is so much. How much is Steve Williams rubbed off on you? Huge. Now now that I'm thinking about yeah, it, he was, he was you like one, one of my years. biggest influences. I mean, I, I grew up in the mall. I can yeah. see it. Yeah. That was awesome, man. He was one of our style. better friends, God, man. <laughs> we actually helped Doc when he got <laughs> Doc got a little bit of issues going across the board with, with Halcyon sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, but, but well, my lawyer issue. got him off like three times. <laughs> 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 Good thing to know a federal lawyer, right? Oh, I mean, right. right. But, uh, no, but you're right, man. Doc was a great yeah, guy. Yeah, so like right. just... Talk about stud. Yeah, yeah. He was right. one of my favorites. So like then in 1992, I would say 93-ish, we started getting orders of the magazine pamphlet showing us like Japanese wrestling tapes. So me and my friend that got the satellite dish would save our allowances, go to one of our parents and say, hey, we got this money, can you write a check for us to get VHS tapes? And then we would start collecting Japanese wrestling tapes cool. in 93 when I was like 11 years That's old. Cool. So that was like my one, one main goal is two because for me wrestling, I looked at it as a sport and like they were athletes. And that's where it was really presented like that in Japan. You know, going back and watching, um, you know, Animal and Hawk in Japan, and then watching guys like Kobashi and Kawada. Did you, and did you watch wrestling when you were younger? I did, I did. Yeah, but it's, again, so it's in your blood. And, and, but the amateur wrestling also, it's funny, my love for pro wrestling started mm -hmm. before that because my school got wrestling. I was like, oh, I want to be a wrestler. Right. I need to join this. <laughs> and my coach actually said I was the most unorthodox wrestler he had ever taught <laughs> because I was just like, oh, I know this. Like, a head and arm throw that's just a headlock takeover I've watched guys do mm -hmm. that on TV all the time sure. and I was actually like went undefeated for the years that I did wrestle but then when I joined a pro wrestling school at so such young age my coach was like oh that stuff's not real you got to pick one or the other I was like well see ya like I don't want to do this I only did this because I wanted to do right, that sure. but yeah you know um, a lot of that was influences and that's why I really focus on the on the gym so much now is because of, of guys like Animal that were but my how it, You started at 14, I believe, right? Yep. How, do, how does that translate? I mean, aren't you a nervous wreck? Because you're, you're wrestling with these older guys, and I'm sure it's pretty territorial. Everybody... You so, know. The, the, the original like training was a two-week summer camp, and then I joined the school after. So, it was a two-week summer camp, and that camp was a lot of kids my age or a little bit older. Um, but, truthfully, because of the love I had for it, I kind of took to it like a fish to water. Mm. Um, I wasn't nervous. I wasn't anything. I caught on to things really quick. Obviously, at 14 in the school that wasn't a very good training school, I wasn't going to become a star just training there. But I was far in advance people that were even in the school before that two-week camp. And that was just, I think, because I loved it so much and paid attention. Yeah, well, the watching, right? Yeah, right. And, and, and some people watch things differently. Like, if you if you go back and look at school until I realized how, how important it was... You know, you'd be like, what is this guy doing? But then with wrestling, I would analyze everything. Mm -hmm. So going into that training, it was just, it was just, just natural to me. It's like, do do okay, game. yeah, do here's do a body do slam. Do oh, you don't need to show me a body slam. I know how to do a body slam because I've watched it since I was born pretty much. I mean, I have, I'm a December baby. So December 13th is my birthday. My first Christmas pictures are me opening up the old LGN action figures. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, all my cousins who were older, that was kind of what they were into. So my family was just like, well, we'll get them wrestling stuff because everybody else in the family likes wrestling <laughs> right. stuff. And then they grew out of it. I got all their hand-me-downs. So I mean, 
I can't remember a time where I didn't tell anybody that could listen that I was going to be a pro wrestler when I grew up. You know, you know, it's kind of it's kind of strange in a way, man. You know, there's kind of like a wrestlers are a different breed, and I'm sure you guys heard that before. They're just a breed. Well, we've seen that. Yeah, well, hey, you, you know firsthand, yeah. right? We've you seen know, it. But I mean, you know, you got to have a certain amount of confidence. You better, yeah. And uh, to get oh, in this yeah. business, and you you better not be shy in any way because guys will set you, and you better not be conceived either because guys will put you in place in a minute. When you guys were breaking in, you guys were both bigger than most of the guys, right? We were bigger than everybody, but but the thing was, People though. People afraid but, to work but, you but, even from well, the beginning? Well, yeah, some of the older guys were, you know, we've had guys like... The Fantastics that were uh, Tommy Rogers and nope. uh, and uh, who had Terry Taylor at the time, right? Oh, your boy would uh, would freaking like run the other way, and they refused the wrestles in Atlanta. They go, "Oh, these guys are killing everybody." But, but, once, but once they got in the ring, in no, but once they got in the ring with us, they saw, God dang, these guys can freaking work. Right. I mean, you know, yeah, but, but you guys work stiff, from what I read, right? You used to beat the shit out of some people. <laughs> no, but, 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 but they Oops. but they had job guys on TV that, that they were paid That's extra money. Had, yeah. <laughs> on George Chim- no, they, no, they were paid Jack Schmidt on George Chim- and George Chamberlain. And Ole Anderson came in and said, "Listen, <laughs> You're gonna get the killed. wrestling business was no. It, I, let me tell you, the wrestling business was in the toilet. Okay. It needed something to do it, and we just happened to be two guys that were oh. found in a bar that could, you know, that can cut a promo. So they said, "Listen, and these guys are going to be rough with you. Just go with, you know, you know, a clothesline's coming. Go with it and kick. Yeah. So you don't kill yourself." And you know, or they don't kill you, because <laughs> we were really swaying them, you know. Yeah. But but we were stiff because a we didn't know we really what we were doing. It was like every time you go into a locker room, it's like going to school. You get in a ring in a different arena, it's like going to school, right? You have your wrestling school, then you keep going to school for the rest of your career, because you got to learn how to wrestle and deal with everybody different, right? So I mean, that's what was different about us. And you know you got to have that love for business, like he said, man. You, once we got our first opportunity, we were the AWA, and Vern Gagne got us our first deal in, in, for uh, All Japan. We were like, oh yeah, because we heard so much good things about All Japan, and the, the Japanese boys at the time, they would beat the dog crap out of you if you if you weren't in there to protect yourself. They were going to take advantage of you. Right. We said no, no, they're not. <laughs> you know. And we put a stop to that immediately. And once you set that tone, everything's cake after that. But we had to wrestle Gordy a bunch of times over there and Doc. And, you know, we, we had to deal with the Freebirds in the U.S. a lot. And, I mean, Terry Gordy can go. He was a machine. Doc could go. I mean, Doc was a four-time All-American in wrestling and football for mm. Oklahoma. I mean, that's a stud right mm. there, right? So, but yeah, man, it's uh, we. But we were told at the time in the business... You guys have got to, we, we got to try to make some kind of impact. And you got to imagine, the first time we walked into the locker room on uh, TBS, at uh, Turner Broadcasting, where they had the NWA show, right? I'm looking and I'm seeing Sergeant Slaughter and Tito Santana and Paul Orndorff and Tommy Rich and Dusty Rose and Ric Flair. I'm going, oh my God, I went there like a, like a church mouse, brother. I didn't say shit. I don't, <laughs> like this, you know? They're like quiet, you know, and Hawk and I are going, oh. and Ole Anderson walks up to us and goes, Here's your belt, here's your belt, don't lose it. Wow. I said, What? We don't even know how to do a cohesive match together yet. But that helped us. Because you know, we did the street fight, you know, although we were <laughs> we had to do some <laughs> some weird things and collect the money, and so we had to sell and get into that. But when we were younger. Why not? But, <laughs> but, but, but no, but the street part fighting part was, was easy for us, mm-hmm. right? Trying to work that was another thing. And we could work it with all the other top guys. They found out we could work that. So then all the top guys were never afraid to work with us. Now, were there some times where they didn't want to give up the reins because here's some new guys coming in? Right. Oh, absolutely. Mr. Wrestling number one, Mr. Wrestling number two, even Tommy Rich and those guys, they were kind of, you know. Hey, we don't want to give up our ground right now. Mm-hmm. Crusher, the Bruiser, they were like that with us too. So, like, who jumps in and says, "Look, these guys are the future of the business. You're going to, None, you're going to no sell." No one and you're really, finish. no one really jumps in. It, it happens the, in the ring. Really? The freight train just yeah, because we, we, yeah. you know, here we go. Uh, point in fact, we're in Milwaukee. Crusher and Bruiser, you know, they're like the freaking gods. 
Hawk and I come down the Black Sabbath Iron Man, they come down to the beer barrel polka. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm standing in the ring, and I say, is this really happening? Are we really in the ring? I said, do you want to dance, Hawk? You know, we were laughing with each other. The polka's playing, you know? But the, <laughs> but no, but but it was like the changing of the guard. The first thing we oh, did, yeah. Oh, yeah. gut shot and press slam. Right. Match was over. Bye-bye. Road Warriors are made, because right. we just did it. Two guys that never left right. their feet. Right. Two of the greatest guys I will love to the day I die, the Funks. Okay. And I say that in a very manly way, not a, you know. We're, but because we were in uh, Kirk and Hall, who he's wrestled a bunch of times, right? Oh, yeah. Freaking packed to the rafters with Japanese fans. They put us over in Kirk and Hall our first time in Japan. Mm. The Funks were gods in Japan. Dory still goes over there and does appearances. You know, mm-hmm. Terry doesn't care to go over there anymore, mm-hmm. but Dory does. That was a big thing. We never forgot that, and we were indebted to them for the rest of our career because they made us, right. and you don't forget that. And that's the message I try to explain to a lot of young guys getting a business. you got to know your lineage of this business. We knew the guys that paved the way for us and appreciate it. There's a lot of people, and he'll tell you going through his camp right now, that don't know jack about wrestling because they really see it on no. TV. Really? They don't know. Oh, yeah. even, oh, boy. They don't even know who the Road Warriors were. Oh really? Oh come on. Bro, go look Google tag team or something. But, but they don't know. You know, which is surprising to yeah. me. Yeah. That's one thing. I if I have anything out there to teach anybody who wants to go any from wrestling schools in the future, know the lineage, yeah. know the people that paved right. the way. Right. Because that, that road getting into somewhere is a lot easier. If you already know how to respect somebody. Well, just like Mike was saying, he's watching tapes and he's learning. So well, you're, 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 you're running it nuts. Do- but it's nuts to think of this way. Like he's mm-hmm. saying people don't know the lineage. I had to look in a magazine, write a letter to another company to send me a catalog to then send a check to get a VHS tape yeah. in the mail. Now... It's at their fingertips and right. they don't know the history. It drives yeah. me so nuts. Now you're running a How school. do you not know it? I know. That, it's so much easier. Well, you're running a school and, you know, today's wrestling, honestly, 150 pounders, 160 pounders, you're still in the game too, twice the size of these guys. <coughs> how do you how do you stay positive, right? Because you got just so people just looking. You know, I understand, like, and don't get me wrong, I don't care if somebody's 150 or 160 pounds. All I care about personally is if they look like an athlete. Mm-hmm. Because there's 150, there's a 160 pounder that that plays, that, that is an MMA fighter. Mm-hmm. And they still look like a badass, yeah. right? So look like some kind of athlete. You know what I mean? Like, if you are... 160 pounds and do a bunch of flips, but you don't look like a gymnast because they're all shredded, then why are you 160 pounds doing flips? Hey, what's your take you know on bigger mean? guys who are not necessarily cut, but can wrestle their ass off like a Kevin Owens? See, and it, personally, there are few and far between. That, but if you can wrestle free, your ass isn't off, he, isn't he? if you can wrestle yeah. your ass off, that's a different thing. Right. But, but then there's people, uh, of Kevin course, Owens but there's also right, people you know, who are so in that out. shape, but there are people that are in that shape that aren't at the level of them Right. That also try to be like, well, that's I can be in this shape and I can do this because of him and them. But those are two very special people, right? right? Not only, you know, Samoa Joe and and Kevin Owens might not be your typical pro wrestler, but still, you look at them and they look like they oh, can do some sure. damage. Yeah, they look like they're going to beat your ass. That's what I mean. well, so that, that's human beings can relate yeah. to them. That's the whole thing is getting rid of. Right. What one thing Hawk and I were. were able to do, we learned this a lot from Paul Ellering, right? He was, a, he was a real shoot manager. We were we were able almost through two and a half decades change with the times. If you can change, our, our gimmick was so far ahead of this time, it would still be hot today because if Hawk were alive because of it was just so far ahead with the, the face paint and the shoulder spike shoulder pads. And we're, we're looking at Kiss. They're, they're still having a 15-year retirement tour. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so we were, uh, we were, but there's very few rare things in this business like that. But, but you know, if you're able to change your times, like we were talking the, the other, uh, this morning we were, while we were standing at the airport waiting, you know, you know, you got guys like, God bless him, Ricochet, great athlete. Mm-hmm. 15,000 head scissors, flying head scissors in a match. Mm-hmm. I said on my podcast one time, why do you do 15 of them? Why not just do a few of them when the timing's right, or do a dive over the top rope and do the? Or how about when a finisher is a finisher? It's exactly. like everybody kicks we'll out of every finisher. We'll do the triple stop. Lindy flip yeah. off the top rope onto the floor when it means something. Don't do it for fifteen high spots. They 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 are doing things now. It's almost like monkey see monkey doing the business. They do it because it's a hot thing right now. The act like it's brand new. You know what? 
Go Google, Google tape from 25 years ago. I don't know, WWF, you'll see me dive over the top rope onto the freaking, uh, uh, I forget who it was, Earthquake and Typhoon mm -hmm. on the floor. I was 320 pounds doing it, mm -hmm. not 150 pounds doing it. Yeah, but Adam, don't you think it's today's audience that's a problem, too? I, did, like see, if this I'm is what I was right. going to counter with. Yeah, right. I, as much as it would be great if we could bring back some of the older strategies of pro wrestling, Maybe but I also can, feel right. it's a it's it's a part and partial thing. Mm -hmm. And within today's time, you got to understand that we don't... So, for instance... I remember talking to D'Lo because he is an agent at Impact and I said, hey, you know, you guys whipped each other off a lot. Why? And they said, well, we wanted to keep it moving because people could turn the channel to WCW. Right. And that made sense to me. But now, we're not fighting that. We're fighting this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we have 200, 300, 500, how many ever people in the audience and if we don't keep the action exciting, well, what's what happened today in the football game what happened yesterday in the basketball game oh who's got a new picture on instagram who's on but Twitter? i think what you're saying it's not so, all ctv anymore right it's like i'll catch it whenever i want to catch it, it but right. even at a live show is what i'm saying at a live show we, we're fighting so much stuff and and to be honest we're in a world more so than ever that you need instant gratification yeah. and because of all the technology we have so as, as much as some styles aren't necessarily what i enjoy I understand the reason for that because you got to keep people's attention and it's very difficult like I know I know I have a four-year-old son at home it's hard to get his attention away sure. you know like hey you're doing this get your attention here and then I finally get his attention it's just it, it, there's always Life something is so that can but is it, yeah right? isn't so it also a problem now. that they're not making stars anymore like the WWE is about the company which makes sense right you don't want to build an animal anymore because you know animal can go somewhere I don't else right? it can hold you up. I, I don't think, but I, I don't right. think it's sustaining I don't think creating yeah. one star is sustaining anymore because no. right now we're in a time where people get injured more often because of the high risk um because of stricter uh, like stricter protocols and everything, people are getting hurt more, they need more time off to recuperate. If you make one star and they have to take time off, it's not as decent as if, if the company is a brand. Sure. So I, as much as, it, like, think about it this way. NBA needs to be NBA for great basketball players and each market's gonna have a great team, but the sport of basketball is what they really need to focus. That's why they start moving into countries like Japan and all this stuff, they're trying to go out there to make it more marketable for other places. Well, the marketing so the NBA right? is a brand rather than just, you know, Michael Jordan's retired years ago. And as much as they try to put LeBron as that one top star, mm -hmm. there's always going to be people like, I don't like LeBron, I like this guy. But Michael Jordan was kind of those one of those worldly renowned basketball players so he could be the star. And I just feel like everything has changed and I really think it's just society is everything is at your fingertips so you can lose you can lose that distraction. I mean, that's every sport. You know, growing up, if you liked hockey, Wayne Gretzky was your guy. Mm -hmm. You could like whoever played on your team, but everybody looked up to Wayne Gretzky. Right. Right. You like basketball, everybody looked up to Michael Jordan. Now, there's debates. Like, there wasn't really so, debates when Michael Jordan was playing. There really wasn't yeah. debates when Wayne Gretzky was playing. So now there's all these debates. Who's the best basketball now, player? Who's the best hockey player? Phone, Who's the best this? Everybody's an expert. Yes, and, and, and that's why no, I think we're fighting the curve. Right. You're right. We're Everybody's fighting the curve of so much, so we have to make one thing a brand and obviously there has to be stars who are, are are greater than the others to to get into new markets and to get people buying merchandise and all that kind of stuff but as a whole i think that's a survival mode thing is making the brand of every wrestling promotion more important mm -hmm. than any one star mm -hmm. because one you never know when a star wants to quit you never know when a star gets hurt you never know any of that and it just happens you but know the, the wrestling business now is better for the guys and girls in it yeah on the fact that if you could build 10 stars instead of two, that's better for you drawing-wise, right? Now they've gotten to the point where they just put the name Impact or WWE, you know, smacked out on the, or, or AEW on there. Bam, they don't even have to list who's there. They do it and they just put the name of the company on there now and they think it's gonna sell out and draw houses. Now a lot of times it does, sometimes it doesn't. You're never gonna see again stars like a, an Andre or a Hogan or they used to compare us to the Hogan and tag teams. You're never gonna see guys that have that much clout in the business again that could pretty much control their own destiny. I mean, we were the first guys to get guaranteed contracts in this business, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and, and we weren't pricks about it, but we, we did play one company against the other because, you know, 
the one company wanted us to come here and we said, hey, we already got a guarantee here. You want to do that? Well, we'll give you opportunity here. Well, I'm sorry. Thanks for the opportunity, but I'm taking a guarantee. And then next thing you know, next time you go back, you got a guarantee. You clearly looked up to the legends as you were coming up. So let me ask you, yeah. when does the light bulb go off on the day that you look in the mirror and go, wait a minute, I am one now. F this. I you want know, what I, I want. I, 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 did that I, 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 I do that, you know, but here's the thing. I get asked to go out every weekend for an appearance. We must have did something right where people still want to see right. me and take my picture. Oh, absolutely. Of course, I'm yeah. in the age of I bring my spike shoulder pads with me. I let the fans put them on from the photos. Let them be a member of the LOD for a picture. You know what I mean? And I paint up, and as long as I could still, you know, I still I'm freaking 285 now. As long as I could stay and work out and look a little bit like animal, I'm okay to the fan. And then if I need be, I can get back in the ring. You know, I'm not, I wasn't banged up, of course, you know, I've had 14 surgeries, broken neck, the whole thing in this business, but we were in the age of, like you say, you were saying, Mike, guys get three, four months off for an injury. Not when we were doing it, bro, the show must go on type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. You know, tape it up. Our first uh, scaffold match, we just came back from, speaking of Japan, we were wrestling uh, Choshu and Tendu in, in Tokyo Dome, and Hawk took a backdrop the wrong way, and broke his leg, and we, I had to tape up his ankle three days later and go up on a scaffold because we were in a main event in a scaffold. What are you going to say? Ah, nah, man, we don't feel like showing up. How did you, handle, how'd you, hand, how'd you handle that scaffold match? That thing really? is like that the thing scariest thing I've up. ever it watched. Was, dude. It was the worst thing I think I've ever been in my life. You know, you had a, I was like McGilla Gorilla up there. <laughs> no, seriously, I was like 320. I was 320. Hawk was 275 on a three foot wide fireman oh, scaffold. Man. That that Look you ever see the fireman scaffold's got all these little yeah, yeah. like it's got all these little hooks in it, so the fireman's boots don't slip when they get wet. <laughs> so when you fell on your chest like this, oh. you had like fifty thousand little cut holes How in your pleasant. body, right? Yeah. Oh, and we were up there in the mid express. God bless those guys, man. They were great guys to be up there with. I wouldn't want to have been up there with anybody else. Who was your favorite team to work with ever? Was it was it? Uh, the horsemen were great, man. Aaron and Tully were yeah. awesome, but okay. I. I I can't really pick out one because I've been blessed in this business, man. I've had an opportunity to work main events for freaking 25 How years. How about a favorite Road Warriors match? You know, I was, uh, I know we're, I'm going to Allentown Sunday and I was singing Allentown, I was singing the Nasty Boys. When, when, when Hawk and I, during SummerSlam, beat the Nasty Boys for the WWF Championships, okay. was the last of the big three belts that you could win. Right. That Madison Square Garden went freaking nuts. I mean, I'm talking a 15 minute LOD. People thought it was freaking a shoot because we treated that. I mean, we don't you know, keep in mind it was a street fight. We beat the dog crap out of each other. Anything and everything that was underneath the ring, we took and we beat each other. You know, no tables or nothing like that, but other stuff we could find, like wrenches and stuff like that. We did everything we can. And it was a great match. That was a great moment. Like any of the matches in the Tokyo Dome were always great moments, man. You know, or the Osaka Dome or anything over in Japan. I, I love, you know, I'm like Mike, man. I, Japan was my favorite th place to work. Okay. But my favorite team to work against in the States was probably, you know, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, the Four Horsemen. They, were, they knew how to make Hawk and I look better than we could even make ourselves look. Mm. And they would fly around for us, but then, man, like when we got hurt, they were like a couple of freaking pit bulls on our injury, you know. You know? And until we came back out of it, you know. But those kind of matches are fun because you learn the psychology so good, and your mind's just going, "Oh, I see why he did that," and you know, "I oh, I see why he wants me to do this," and you, you start learning the business. I think, Mike, I don't know if you agree. That's what's kind of missing in our business today. In these camps, and for whatever company, whether it's AEW, WWE, my philosophy is: How can you teach someone to get to the Super Bowl if you've not been to the Super Bowl? Right, that's a good point. If you've not played the Super Bowl, coach it or whatever. So that's why I say, man, you need to get some of these guys from my era backstage teaching some of these guys how to do the psychology of a. You can still do all the high flying crap, then you want to do it. But there still has to be a rhyme or reason why you're doing well, it's something. Got, it's got to be a story. Right. Had, I, the fans love stories. I think 
that's where we lost the fans a little bit in the oh, wrestling yeah. business for a while oh, yeah. because it was just hot shot, hot shot, hot shot, hot shot. Kick out. No story. <laughs> kick out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 50,000 kick kick outs, right? No kick stories. You, you have Now they're starting to go back to storylines. People, fans like to get emotionally invested, mm -hmm. then they will get financially invested. And speaking of storylines, uh, Mike has been going up against uh, Miss uh, Tessa Blanchard. Mm -hmm. uh, this has brought a lot of attention to you. Uh, how do you feel this will play out in the long run? With and do you have aspirations to get to Vince? You know, the What's Tessa stuff I think is amazing because she's just an amazing wrestler, not oh, yeah. as a female wrestler, just oh, as a wrestler. Yeah. And I think the plus side of Impact is they're really willing to do something with her that other companies aren't willing. This to. is true. Um, so I think that's going to put different eyes on Impact. And especially because now that we've moved to Access, we have a better TV deal, more people are going to be able to see us. We are definitely offering something that AEW has full out said they're not going to do intergender wrestling. When you were um, approached with this, how did, what was your reaction? Well, I haven't got to wrestle her yet. There have been talks of it. And now she's going up with Sammy coming up for the pay-per-view in right. Dallas. Right. But when it was brought up and they said they might have me and her do some stuff, I said, that's awesome because she's an amazing wrestler. Right. And... Um, the biggest thing, as I said, is I don't think anybody else in the wrestling landscape is going to go full throttle with how they've done it with her, and which I think is really good. Uh, one, for wrestling as a whole, and two, for society. Um, and she's just, as I said, you can't say she's a great woman's wrestler. She's just a great wrestler. Mm -hmm. She's awesome out there. She really is motivated. Um, you know, we, we go on the road a lot. Uh, we have our crew that go to the gym and she's one of them that is mm -hmm. not missing the gym and not missing all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so she really takes everything super serious and she has a chip on her shoulder in the sense of yes I'm a Blanchard but I don't want that to be why I succeed so right. she's that much better because she pushes her, pushes herself to be at the top without having to be a Blanchard mm -hmm. which I, I admire hugely because you know we've seen in sports whether it be wrestling or movies or basketball or anything that a lot of people will have that last name that's known and they kind of take the easy route because of that last name and she's the exact she's opposite not doing which that. Is, is amazing right um, I think she's right on par with Charlotte uh, 100%, uh, I, mean, 100%. Really, I can't wait yeah, to see yeah, she, those two someday yeah. I know Vince must be thinking about this oh, I'm sure Vince has probably been called with it you know oh that would be beautiful I'll tell, tell you what oh. when, when I first heard of Tessa going to get some of the guys and I'll be real quite honest with you I'm old school in the sense that I think girls should wrestle girls and guys should wrestle guys. Okay, I'm not against her wrestling, working with Mike or anything, because she's proven that she can. Um, I just hope they don't make it a long-term thing where she's got to wrestle. Listen, right. look at him. Yeah, exactly. yeah. that's what I'm saying. No, no, listen, no I'm I don't want to come off the it's, uh, it's so unbelievable My point me. exactly I mean, is, for me, yeah, and, okay, my point exactly is Nyla Rose. Yeah, that's a freaking man. Yeah, that's a freaking man. Yeah. He should beat the dog crap oh, out of the. But by the way, yeah. by, by the way, yeah. they put they let yeah. a hundred and five or eighty five pound woman beat her. I, which I made no sense. No, no. no. <laughs> but, but my point. Were you watching AEW? Yeah, my, my, my I tried to pay is, attention to it. But right, like, like Mike right. said, though, with society, you see it all the time, and I'm so happy with this that with all the abuse that's going on in our society and everything else, it's. Awesome to see women standing up for themselves and fighting. Oh, sure. And she's a great representation of that part sure, of it, right? Sure. So, because you see it all the time, and well, you're right, with the age of this, the yeah. phone and everything, you see it, it's more prevalent now. So, in today's, it wouldn't have worked 20 years ago. Today it works, right? I don't know if you're going to be able to work it to a freaking three year program, but it will work for the short term here. Because it'll give him credibility because he's not wrestling a chump female. There was a, if you remember back in the, in the day, there was a, when uh, kickboxing was really hot. Mm -hmm. um, the guy that refs most of the uh, MMA fights here, uh, Big Mike, uh, what's his name? Big John, uh, John, what's his name? I got McCarthy. The mug, I don't John McCarthy. Yeah, John McCarthy. They had him over there doing kickboxing stuff with the top female. Man, he knocked that female out in two seconds. <laughs> sure. Two seconds. <laughs> Doink. But in our business, you can put the illusion, yeah, okay, I'm going to overpower with my man stuff, but one slip up, here she comes with the bam, 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 
And the fans are going, holy crap, look at that. And then it becomes interesting, right? Possibly. Possibly. You're right, you're right, man. You know, but but it's, it's you know, I, 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 I just don't think it's going to, it, it wants to be something you can do all the time. Mm -hmm. right. Like, I don't like, I hate mixed tags. Hate it with oh, a passion. Yeah. Hate it with a passion. No, not believable. Can't tell a story. Can't do anything with a mixed tag. Right. Because it's always the guy against the guy and the girl right. against the girl. You know, and, and it's just kind of a, it's a TV time filler. Look, even Japan does this with the eight man tags over and over and over with no end result. There's no storyline yeah. here. Come that's on. Why I left, that's why I left Japan. Yeah, time, stop. Yeah. Oh, by the way, while I have you here, former Ring of Honor world champion, I got to ask you, what's your take on ACH? You know oh what? Boy. As oh a wrestler, boy. I love him to death. Um, we had our differences for other reasons outside of wrestling. Not that we hated each other, but we just we clashed. Is We're two different personalities. No, 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 not at all. I think he's a great, a, as I said, a great guy. There was just certain things we clashed on. Okay. Um, now his outrage about the T-shirt, <coughs> I understand why that would why that would upset him, I upset know, other people of color. No, I, I get all that. This T-shirt controversy with the. No, oh, okay. but so so I understand okay. the racial undertones that that shirt provided. Oh, and I, I heard about and, that. And I I, I agree that, that yeah, I he should have spoke up. Okay, maybe not. How about publicly? Like that's know. what I mean. Maybe I, I'm not. I don't think uh, business stuff should be handled publicly. Right. But that's personally, I, and right. you know, if he felt that that was the only way to listen, maybe I don't know the full story. Maybe he did say something to them in private, and it was just dismissed. Right. So the only way he could bring light to it is publicly. Right. Maybe I don't know. Right. Um, you cat from WWE you just quit. Yeah, yeah. And, you know uh, what? I, I just hope right. about it totally the wrong way. <laughs> uh, yeah, now I know what you you're know, talking about. Yeah. I just hope. I uh, thought he had a T-shirt problem. No, 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 no. no, 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 no I just no, hope. No. You know, I hope that. It's solely a work thing. I hope there's nothing else going on. You know, as I said, we had For some clashes. We had some clashes just because of our personalities, but I still respect him. I still mm -hmm. like him. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's a, I still consider him a friend. If he mm -hmm. called me tomorrow and needed a favor, I would be there for him. Okay. But I hope that it only has to do with professional stuff. I, I, I just hope there's nothing else wrong because to react that way... It, it worries me that maybe something else is Honestly, bothering him. Honestly, it was a work at first. It, I, I it might it not. It, listen, don't count to come, man. It may be a work. Mm. Yeah, you, you can never know. know. Yeah, you, you never know in this business, man. It may be a work. AEW already said that they're not going to touch him. They're like, we're not touching him. Which I want. That, that's the problem with going publicly because right. if you're an issue for one place, why wouldn't you yeah. be an issue? And that's why you I don't think the only, yeah, I don't think going publicly is good because yeah. in this day and age, you can start a firestorm over something that. Mm -hmm. Look, and, and again, not that this is minor. I don't want to downplay that. Mm -hmm. You know, to him and to to the other you know black wrestlers that had sure. an issue with it. I understand. I'm just saying, there's other situations like that that are much minor for other people that they bring it publicly and it becomes this big issue so if you're going to do that every time there's an issue why would a company want that liability right. that's a that's a big yeah, that and put it exactly. where it belongs right the head of marketing whoever else was in charge of that they made a mistake they let it go through it ended up looking bad handle it there and, and right? again but i said we don't know maybe he did reach out privately and it was just Dismissed. I think I heard that he saw the gray in the blue shirt, but didn't see the black shirt. And yeah. you know, again, stupidity watching that go out. But you know, there's worse things that happen. So you know, man. Here, here, here's, yeah. the, here's the thing, man. In our society, there is not one person who has not done or said something stupid, made a mistake, or even in the marketing department or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, it, but you're in the age, of the millennial age, with the millennials that just like. Oh my god. No, seriously, <laughs> man. That's what I like you, the you, face. You, 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 know, you, you know, JJ's got a question, but you're going back to a point where everybody's got a phone, everybody's got a voice, everybody yeah. thinks they could say everything, everybody's got a television show. Look, hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> JJ. No, I just oh, want well. to say, you know, I've done over 113 things for WWF, WWE, and WCW. And I want to tell people, people can tell, you know, a lot of people that don't understand about the wrestling business. I've been close to all these guys my whole adult life. I wrote the music for Hawk and Animal, and Jimmy Hart's my partner, and he wrote lyrics and approved and made suggestions. But anybody that's sitting out there watching this show and, and says, you know, those wrestlers, they're just a bunch of big, dumb guys. This dialogue that you hear right here have just heard proves that these guys are the furthest thing in the world from big, dumb guys. Very intelligent people and very knowledgeable 
and very specially talented, more than you would ever imagine. You've got to be really smart to be a wrestler, a great wrestler. Absolutely. Like well, thanks, Amen. man. Yeah, man. When they when they had us put uh, when they you know we you know, hawk to the uh, what a rush one time on an interview. Then he says, "Hey, can we throw it on the front of the music that you wrote for us?" Right. Well, I went backstage and got Vince to do it. That's Vince that's doing yeah. it on that short. Oh, so you knew that too. You know that was Vince that did Oh What a Rush? No, we, we knew something was going on because Hawk was at the curtain and they came to us last minute and they said, hey, can you do the Oh What a Rush before you go out to the ring? And Hawk and I were pretty good at being Johnny on the spot. We, we kind of kid around a lot, but we were called the One Cut Kids. If we had a hundred uh, at the time, you know, cable stations to do TV promos for, we never messed up one, man. We just would just knock them out in a Those couple. Those local promos are a pain. Oh, brother, pain. <laughs> but we would knock them out and out of an issue. So when it came time on a live TV, Hawk says, do all what a rush, and then they're going to kick in his music in the truck. You know, Hawk and there went, what a rush, and bam! The music played at the right time. I still use that when I go do personal appearances. Really? That same thing, the same rift, everything, man. I use it all because, you know, Hawk and I were a little different, though. We already had owned Road Warriors and Legion of Doom name and everything else before we even went there. Mm. So, you know, no one paid for our face paint or our shoulder pads or our gear. We paid for everything. You know what I mean? But when these guys did it, and of course Jimmy, Jimmy and, and us have been friends for, gosh, 30, 35 years. And, you know, I know Jimmy Hart. Great guy, good human being, man, and he... Hey, yo, Animal Hawk, I got this idea for you. It's going to be great. <laughs> you know, when people would ask me, they would say, McGuire, does uh, Hawk and Animal like the theme? I said, brother, I'm not asking them a damn question. No, <laughs> they right. squash me if they don't like that it. No, but it did, though, but these guys knew how to play a music that fit our character. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, they, yeah. they, they can know the beat. They know our stuff was more heavy metal bass type stuff, you know? And they knew that anything with heavy bass in it was going to be good for us going to the ring. And you throw a lot of watch on front of it, you didn't even need to have no words with does, it. Does Animal like heavy metal in real life? Oh, yeah. Man. Nice. I, Let's I, talk I, some Iron Maiden. I, I, I was oh, a sorry. Led Zeppelin, <laughs> Metallica <laughs> guy. You know, and, Metallica, and, uh, Sabbath, yeah, man. Little yeah, Sabbath. Yeah, man. Nice. That's where, that's where we, one day we were sitting there nice. and um, you, know, you come out of doing one of our tours in the very beginning. We were in a Red Roof Inn and we got in the car and you would go, go eat at a Bob Evans or something. We were in, you know, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, all of a sudden you hear on the radio, <laughs> Damn! I looked over at Hawk, he looked at me, I said, brother, <laughs> this has got to be this our music the, right here. Song. And we start saying, hey, we went to Oli, we said, hey man, we got an idea. Right. Let's throw this music. You guys are getting the age of doing music. Let's throw music in front of us. Right. Until they wanted ten thousand dollars of copyright, and so we said, "Yeah, uh, yeah." yeah and then Sharon. Well, 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 speaking of music, you you were in the AWA. First, I want to know how you felt about working for Vern, but yeah. then two, how was it working with the Freebirds? Did, did you feel oh. like that worked out? Because I got to tell you, when you went there and that they tried to build that feud, I, I we're WWE guys or WWF guys, right. Northeast. But I was totally sold on that, right? I was really excited for that to happen, but just it didn't seem to click like I thought. You know, it, would. It, it didn't have the flavor you wanted to have. Listen, I loved working with the Freebirds, you know, with Michael Hayes and Terry Gordy, and you had Buddy on the outside. When we were at the the NWA, you know, we would do stuff like realization stuff that the southern people related to. Like they they hand me they handcuffed me to the rope inside of a cage one time in Marietta, Georgia, and they beat the dog crap crap out of Hawk. And I'm trying to fight, and I'm pulling, and I'm, you know, but it, I think it was more to have, being able to have me selling like that to my partners getting his rear end kicked, that Vern didn't take the time to do those. There are no little things in our business. Everything is a big thing, right? So they didn't let us do that against the Freebirds in the AWA. They tried to hot shot it by letting the Freebirds paint up one time. We wrestled at Kaminsky Park in between a doubleheader for a baseball game, and you know, people just kind of went, you farted it. I mean, it looked cool. They had the red, white, and blue Union Jacks on their, you know, mm -hmm. Southern Union Jacks on their, for, on their face, and it looked great, but they didn't do any heat to get us the heat, you know? And, and you know, we did a big event with them, Wrestle Rock. You yeah, know, yeah. Remember, did the Wrestle Rock, they had like 40,000 people at the 
a mini oh, rock and roll Buck Zumhoff. <laughs> no, 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 he was a piece of work. Let me tell you. Yeah, we've heard he's a piece of something else yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a whole other story. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, might, you might see Buck underneath your shoes somewhere. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, my God. That's really bad. No, but they you know, oh but, uh, you know uh, Vern, Vern was an interesting cat. Vern's yeah. it was my way of the highway. Mm. Vern was that, really that kind of cost him. Really, well, it did cost him in the end. And Vern could have just grew at the times, brother. Imagine he's got Eddie Einhorn in his back pocket, one of, who owned all college football networks. We're on ESPN. Mm. We're getting a free hotel at the yeah. show, but we're recording yeah. our TVs right in the hotel. Yeah. And on ESPN, it was number one rated station was AWO Wrestling. What happened? Bro, he just lost it. Oops. Oops. <laughs> the A was. I don't know how. They were no, loaded. At one point, anybody. that roster was loaded. He wouldn't sign anybody to guaranteed contracts. Right. He, he wanted would. to cut Hogan on the t shirts. Yep. He, he would That's adjust, really stupid. He would adjust to people's uh, growth in the business or ideas. It right. all had to be his ideas. Right. And it just got to be to a point, man, and said, listen, man, this is like spinning wheels and I can't even. You know, they had great guys come through. There guys, you know, that weren't really nationally known, like the Long Hour, Long Riders, mm-hmm. Scott and Bill Irwin, yeah. were freaking great. I mean, Hawk and I wrestled Jerry Blackwell and Sergeant Slaughter was a freaking great match. Wow. You know, Sla- uh, Jerry Blackwell is one of the guys you're talking about. Big, dumpy, you know, freaking Stone Mountain Georgia guy. Yeah, but. That was believable. He could throw, he gets in, he gets in the face with a drop kick. Yep. At 450 pounds. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and the way we sold for him, it made, people were going, oh, holy crap, they're down. You know, and that kind of mystique, you know, Vern just, he just lost it, man. I don't know how he let it slip through his fingers. And a lot of it too was, you know, you had Greg, his son, running a lot of things back there, and Greg kind of was like, mm, "Good old tennis legs." My dad's, mm-hmm. my dad's company, you know, type of thing. You got to listen to me. You know? So that's where kind of that got kind of screwed <laughs> up, man. <laughs> but the, but the Freebirds in the rural, I mean, we, we drew great money in the NWA, drew a little bit of money in the AWA, but uh, it just was. I don't know what happened. You're right, man. That flavor was gone. There was, just, there was something a little missing. As there. a fan, being a Freebird fan, Road Warrior fan, seeing that yeah. coming, because that, you know, and then it just it just, it just, just didn't have it. Just, you know, I was, I was looking almost like Von Erich-ish. Yeah, man. You, you know, Freebird-ish. Because people, people put us together and, <clears throat> you know, Terry Gordy and I would come in there and do that first high spot, and we were like two freaking freight mm-hmm. trains hitting each other. And it would, you would have, it had all the makings of doing something, but it just... It fizzled out for whatever reason. So, WWE wins the entire battle. So you're going. Was is it true that that was the ultimate goal to get to New York? And then for you, Mike, is that your ultimate goal for your career? To get to New York. We say New York, but it's not you New know, York you know, anymore. Vince, you know. There's different reasons I'd want to go there. Um, mainly, I, I feel that especially with the landscape now you hear that they're offering people a lot more money so they don't go elsewhere Mm -hmm. Uh, stability for my family would be one but as a whole that was really never my main goal like my number one goal was Japan that was what I wanted and then along the way you would get other goals so I started training in 2001 had my first match in 2002 and then one of my goals was to I want to be a Ring of Honor world champion Bingo. So like those yeah. little goals, I would pick aside. But really, the the end result was I wanted to go to Japan. And uh, now that I've done that and leaving New Japan, I've gotten a lot of opportunities. You know, I went over for Big Japan. Now I'm going over for NOAA. I have all the other companies hit me up. I feel like if I ever had the opportunity to go, you know, to Vince, I would definitely go there because after I know I would still kind of have that sure. Japanese sure. thing that I could go back to Mm -hmm. you know I've got my name over there now you know I went over in the summer for Big Japan they had their biggest uh, crowd in Corican since 2010 we made record numbers for t-shirt sales all that kind of stuff so now that I've got that kind of foot in Japan where I can go over there and I'll be popular and people want to see me and the companies want me over there now I could see the realization of going to to Vince you know a little bit easier but really man I, I I wrestle because I love it. I wrestle because I enjoy it. And I've known so many people that end up having this distaste for wrestling going there mm. that it almost puts you off in the same token. Because I'm having the time of my life right now. You know, like I said, <clears throat> there's guys I want to wrestle in Japan where I could literally just call the Japanese company now, like, hey, I really want to wrestle so and so. Do you want to bring me over? Of course, we'd love to bring you over. And Impact's going great right now. Like, I, I just 
finished up wrestling Eddie Edwards on TV and I think we're going to start doing something together and he's one of my favorite people to wrestle so I'm just having a great time and it's showing that love for wrestling which is is why I do this my life is eclipsed by wrestling my wife's a former wrestler Mm -hmm. Uh, I teach my class twice a week I wrestle three times a week so I have two days that wrestling aren't you know at the forefront but still I'm at the gym doing my cardio on my phone is wrestling so I just I love this and I want to do it to where the passion is still there to do it so I don't ever want to get put in a position where that passion starts fading you know for, you know you were talking about those eight main tags that do in Japan mm-hmm. all the time not that my passion was dwindling but I felt like my creativeness as a pro wrestler has yeah. always come from what I do in the ring because when I went to ring of honor they put a manager with me. They didn't want me to talk. And then when I became champion, they're like, talk in sound bites and we use it for packages. I'm like, listen, I can talk. And then I go to Japan and speak easy English because the Japanese crowd can only under- understand easy English. Mm-hmm. And our translators can only translate so much. So now I'm also getting that freedom to be able to show people I can talk and everything. So it's just like, now I'm in that time where I'm really loving absolutely every aspect of wrestling I do. I love being able to go to the show tonight and wrestle somebody I've never wrestled before and see how good of a match I can have with them. And then go to Impact TV tapings and wrestle guys like Eddie Edwards and Brian Cage or Tessa, some of the best wrestlers in the Mm -hmm. world. And then go to Japan and love the country, love the food, love the wrestling over there. As I said, I'm just enjoying myself with everything I do right now that um, as much as it might be an end result to go to, to Vince, I just I'm enjoying the ride right now, and I want to keep doing that as long as there's food on the table and clothes on my kid's back. I'm pretty happy. Hey, he's gonna be a rarity. He's a rarity in the business today because he, he's a big guy that can do great things, mm-hmm. good things, mm-hmm. right? So <clears throat> that he so therefore he's marketable to go, and I'm sure probably someday he will get the WWE. You know, for for us it was uh, <clears throat> back when the NWA was hot. Um, we got called up and we went to Greenwich, Connecticut, you know, and went to Vince's house and had lunch with he and, a, and his, uh, he's got a, he had a, a Chinese maid there. Vince or, chewed food in front of you? Bro, I heard he, Vince doesn't, he ate, he ate I, I heard Vince doesn't eat <laughs> in, in front of us. He made some, <laughs> I, I, think I, I think I threw Mike off with that one. Bro, he, he made some healthy, <laughs> healthy chicken fried rice and sushi and everything uh, at his house, is right? Is this true that he... Drenches his steak with ketchup. No, I, see, he knows that he's a strange true. bird. Is it true? I've heard that. That is true. Before the show. Oh, you've he seen him eat too? Wow. Ate, uh, yeah. Kevin Dunn sat there and ate yeah. with him. But ever, Jimmy Hart says, McGuire, don't look at him. Why? He's, right. <laughs> so he's got little, 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 You pull up to there and you had two Great Danes at the time. Two big Great Danes <laughs> were laying there sleeping. And we go in there and we got Accent to, smash. We, <laughs> right. We didn't know we got to talking. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, and, he and that that was one of the times where we we had the guaranteed contract by the NWA already in our hands, and we went there with Vince. And he said, "Well, I go, all I can do is offer you opportunity here." And I said, "Yeah, but Vince, opportunity." I said, "We got a guaranteed contract here. We we want to come oh. here because at the time it was the last of the big three to win." Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we knew we were so red hot. We knew we were going to get a great push anyway. Not that we needed it, but if if we could make money. Now you write today, marketing and everything so much different with sponsorships. It doesn't really matter if a guy, that's why you won't see a guy get like we were because they don't need to. Right. You got freaking Cheerios paying you $10 million or $20 million. You got every company doing that, you don't need it. Even Saudi Arabia is paying them how many millions of dollars to do five or six shows, whatever it is. But you know, when you had Hawk and I, and so we're sitting there, we, we did the deal, and you know, Vince got up and left the room one day and of course, he left the marketing reports on the desk. And we looked, yeah, we knew it was on purpose. We're not scared. <laughs> <laughs> we looked over there, and we, saw, we saw a Hulk Hogan riding Piper, and we're looking, God dang, man, 750 grand. I mean, freaking, uh, uh, did I forget uh, this? I'm sorry. Underwear, for Christ's sakes, kids, underwear, right? Uh, anyway, but we didn't see that that was the total amount. That wasn't the percentage of what the guys are getting. So, right. so we're looking at that. And so anyway, we decided to say, hey, man, thank you, but no thanks. We really want to come here, but we got a three-year guarantee, three to five-year guarantee deal. We're going to take the guarantee. Went home about two months later, birth of demolition. Everybody thought, oh, no, we're going to be mad at demolition. No, we're not going to be mad. Mass Superstar helped get us over. Mm. Barry Darso Smash was, you know, I've known him since I was 16. How am I going to get mad at one of my best friends? So like, you're, are you basically telling us that we wouldn't have had demolition if you had signed. 
Oh my probably god, dude. We wouldn't have had demolition. This is horrible. Oh, thank god you didn't sign right, right away. So, Oi. Because we, how did demolition feel when you did show up? Oh, yeah. Well, uh -oh. Demolition was born, <laughs> and then we were there, and we stayed and finished out our contract. Okay. Went to Japan for a couple years. Yeah. Next thing you know, now it's time. Oy. And here we are. I mean, all four of us talked, you know, smash. King Kong meet Godzilla. Oh, yeah. my God. Let's go here. We got the Road Warriors against <laughs> this, Demolition. This so Everybody's called you guys imposters for all these years. Everybody's saying, you guys got to be hot. Want to kill them? Neither did anybody know. We all were buddies. Yeah, I'm right? sure. You know, Want to appear? So, and when we got there... Vince had us beat him in seven minutes on TV. Yeah, they totally just... We were so bad, what? We but thought for sure any, it was going to be a year, two-year-long marriage. Any, you know? any protest behind the scenes? Like, Vince, man, Brother, we, we tried and we tried and we tried. We said, no, no, man, we got a different direction we're going with you guys. And they just had us going there and pretty much start steamrolling everybody. I got to tell you, growing up, we loved both of you guys. We loved you both. But we were so disappointed with that. We were, we were disappointed. Like, what happened? We were disappointed. You know why? Oh, because most a blood of the time bath. in our career, I got a bath. We, we, we didn't get a chance to work long programs. Yeah. We did with the Midnight Express a little bit and with yeah. the Four Horsemen, of course. Yeah. But we never got to work that long program that really wanted to work, you know? And we thought, oh, man, we're going to New York. Demolition. Yeah. The next thing you know, they dropped the belts, you know, after we... Well, that's when I knew... Nasty boys, and I said, oh, what? Mm. No, but that's when I knew they, they were totally just squashing it. They had the SummerSlam, yeah. you guys mm. came and interfered. Do you think it had to do with that uh, That Axe was injured and... Uh, yeah, it did. And Axe, Axe, Axe had a little crush. bit of a heart issue, True. right? Yeah. The then end, they had right Crusher as a backup. Right. Right. And, you know, God bless them, you know, once we were in there, too, my partner had his freaking issues. He was suspended about six times the company for mm. abuse, you know. And so that didn't help the situation either. You know, you got a company that's putting millions of dollars into promoting you, and you just say, ah, screw off, I want to go. As a friend, yeah. how hard is that for you? Where, like, do you talk to him like, yo, bro? Yo, bro, bro, I told him all the time. I said, brother, I have three kids, and a fa I got a family here, man, and when you give me that three months off, I, I have three months off with no pay. Right. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not happy about having those three months off, but when you're in that frame of mind, man, you're just not thinking right. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you're thinking about what makes you happy, what makes you feel good at the time. You're not thinking about anybody else. Guys, in the is, is the business itself intoxicating without drugs, without roids, without you alcohol, know, without partying? I, is the business the I, business itself? I think the business has changed in that as, as aspect a lot for the better. Okay. It's not so bad. Like with being, I mean, substance abuse that bad. I mean, no, you, you don't know, hear about a guy. Very, Once in a while, guy, you guys are here and there. Okay. But also, I think that's again. I can't speak too much. Obviously, he can speak much greater to it. But what from the eighties? But what I mean is, you know, you hear about these three hundred dates a year. Sometimes Sundays you're running to events and stuff like that. And as he said, now there's so much protocol in place that if you bump your head, you're forced to take three right, months yeah. off. You're off. You know what I mean? Okay. But back then. Three months off means, well, brother down the street's coming in and taking my spot. I can't take those three months off. So I can only think that they relied on that stuff to keep going. You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's right to do, yeah, not saying yeah, anything yeah. like that. Yeah. But it's a different monster now where there's so much protocol that you are forced to take time off. Like, I fractured my orbital in Japan. <laughs> And they said, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, it's okay. I'll bruise up tomorrow. They're like, are you sure you're okay? I'm like, I'm fine. And then I had a shower, and I blew my nose in the shower, and I came out, and it was oh. puffed up. And they're like, you got to go get that checked <laughs> yeah, out. Right, yeah. And I'm, I'm like, no, no, I'm fine. I'll work, I'll work tomorrow. It's it. okay. You know what I mean? And they're like, okay. no, you have to go get an x-ray. I wasn't going to get an x-ray mm -hmm. because I didn't want to take time off. Yeah. And that's now. But you are forced. Right. And 100% is better because better that's off, probably yeah. why we don't, nobody is getting hooked on, mm -hmm. on painkillers or, or anything else. Well, they're giving a much, reserve, yeah. much deserved rest. You know, that's why, you know, there's a big lawsuit against the WWE because, you know, they bought, once you buy out all the other companies, you're kind of responsible for whatever went on those companies. And it's not that you get into the wrestling business saying, hey, you don't know that you're going to get chair shots, you're not going to get concussion. You know you're going to get concussion. But when you're afraid to say, hey, man, I got a concussion because wrestler B is wanting to jump in your shoes and it's so hard to get that spot, it's not, man, I'm cool, let's go. Mm. And you go and do it. And you're wrestling 300, 325 days a year and, you know, twice Christmas Day, twice New Year's Day, twice on Thanksgiving, you know, and everybody's got their families in and you're away from your family doing it. 
you know, I, I had the same thing. Warlord wanted to do a Samoan slam on me, and went, when I went back, he pulled me too hard this way, and he was 365. He pulled me down, landed on my head, and, and my my head popped like a zit. My left eye popped out, Ooh, went back hey. in, yep. and from that one mood, I had a cracked skull, broken cheek, blew out my orbit, and uh, and uh, had a, a fractured jaw over there. And because you landed right on my head, I mean, everything came mm. down on my face. And But when I did the same thing, I went into the locker room, blew my nose, my cheek went, because you blew that, that right. sinus, the sinus door, and when I pushed on it, it went, <laughs> the flutter, it flutter, it flutters in the corner of your eye, and you're going to yourself, something is really messed up here, this ain't right, you know? But, you know, that night I went to Chicago General. The good thing I was in the U.S., I went to Chicago General, and they said, man, did you go head first through a car? Mm. I said no, I man. I just came from a wrestling match. I got slammed right. by Warlord. He goes, "How are you walking?" Yeah, he goes, "They go said, how are you walking in here? Yeah. You should be on a freaking gurney." And they right. said, "There's no way. You got a major, major, major." And I had the operation. Of course, I was supposed to be out six months, but then again, show must go on. Three months. Yeah, painted on top of my face is still numb to this day. This half of my face from here down on my lip is numb. Mm. I had to reteach myself how to talk mm. for an interview. Yeah, man, because you know, of the energy. But that's part of the business, man. Now, you, you're, you're part of that lawsuit, right? Against the WWE? Yeah, you know, I joined. here's why I joined the lawsuit. Oh. Yes, have I had about 15, 20 concussions in the business? Yes. Was I felt pressure a lot of times to keep going on with the show? Yes. Got power bomb from, from DX off the table, through the freaking table on the floors to help get those guys over. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes, I knew that. But on the same sense... I'm doing it because once you've established so much in this business, you should be given some kind of respect. Like some of the guys, like, like for instance, Ivan Koloff, God rest his soul, right? Mm -hmm. Had a bad ankle problem. Wanted to be part of the Legends contract. And they said, no, you, you can't do it. He goes, I only want to do it for the 10 grand. I need it to get my ankle rebuilt. No, it's not a charity case. Are you kidding me? Hmm. That guy should have had health insurance for life. You are worth billions of dollars. That's why I joined on with the lawsuit. I didn't want to be in the face of a lawsuit like they made me, of course, but I joined it for the guys, for the boys, to be able to get something out of what you put into this business. Because let's face it, once you're gone, you're gone. So, but that there. Animal, here's, here's a point though, right? As the boys, you guys could have got together, you could have created a union, but you seem, as a group, can't seem to get your shit together. So you continue to stay independent contractors, mm -hmm. and so where's the responsibility lie? Does it lie on the wrestler also? And what is yeah, it? it is on the wrestler's fault, man, because you listen, the guys used to try to do it before, like Hogan and Ventura that tried it, bam, blackballed. Right. You get blackballed and no one will ever use you again. Now, AEW has become the closest by giving the guys health insurance and everything else right now. Well, they get them health insurance because they're officers in the company. They are yeah, actually employees. Yeah. See, that, the other wrestlers are not getting that, that. that. That was a misconception that everybody forgets to realize. Right. They've, yeah, he has a work for hire type thing, so they're not all getting insurance. I believe if you're working for the company, they can afford, afford it. Look, you got Tony Khan with all the money the Khans have. You could pay to have everybody have insurance in your company. You, Vince could pay to have everybody have insurance. Does this in the not become, and again, this is just devil's advocate, mm -hmm. does this not become the problem? Because I'm assuming other sports have some kind of insurance, right? Well, most of them unions. Right, yeah. Right? So oh, yeah. You look at NBA or NBA, MLB. Okay, I'm a big baseball fan. Sure. Somebody sprains their finger, they're off for six weeks. Mm -hmm. They don't have to worry about it because they have a union and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I feel like maybe that's a problem with why it's very hard to do with wrestling because a lot of things look. Will come we have like a lot of guys like yourself in it. here. I asked the same question. The older guys, I'm telling you, the more successful ones, like nah. I'm myself. I did it for myself. I took care of myself. You can't keep your money. That's your problem. Mm -hmm. You got a drug problem. Your problem. Yeah. Look, I agree. Right. A guy like Ivan Koloff, that guy made billions of dollars. Uh, and again, I don't know what Vince McMahon does. I have no clue. Mm -hmm. He could have given Ivan Koloff a billion dollars. But then on the other hand, you got a guy like superstar Billy Graham, right? Vince McMahon has helped that guy a million times, and all that guy does is trash <laughs> him yeah, on a regular yeah. basis. I would say one awesome. thing about the healthcare thing. Obviously, it would be great. I'm paying like $1,500 a month for health insurance yeah, for me and my family. Yeah, a lot of money. But in the same token, every company I've ever been with that I've ever had to visit a hospital, they have covered. 
So like I got split open at Ring of Honor. Mm. I had to go to emergency room, which is even with insurance is very expensive. They paid sure. that. Fractured my orbital in Japan. New Japan paid that. I hurt my knee in Japan. New Japan paid all that. Even with the insurance, you know, you're looking at four thousand dollars for the knee after all uh, everything. So like luckily, may- maybe the health insurance is there, which obviously would be a huge help than paying that fifteen hundred bucks a month. But every company I have been with has been good and paid for any injuries that happen within that company which you know my hat's off to them because legally we are independent contractors mm-hmm. they don't have to do that mm-hmm. so you know at least they have looked out and, and again i can't speak on wwe because i've never been there but with ring of honor before with with new japan i luckily i haven't been heard i've only been with impact since april but i'm certain that they would be the same the same type yeah, of company japanese that companies always took care yeah of they have always taken care of the boys you know listen <clears throat> when i had warlord did my orbital rim when i was in wwf my insurance paid for it. When I broke my back, my insurance paid for it. I had to pay the big nut on the other end of it, right? So, you know, and little things like that, and here I am, and I know for a fact <laughs> I'm number one or two in merchandise sales for the company at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. I'm making you a little bit of extra dough. Mm-hmm. Slide me an extra 5% on my merchandise, yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, That's all you have to do, and I think that's where it's different today is they're making so much more money on royalties mm-hmm. that the guys don't, who cares? I'll pay the insurance. Yeah, they're good. And listen, it's not about me not knowing that, hey, you're going to get hurt. I know you're going to get hurt. I Listen, I wasn't a dummy getting into it. It's not That's not what I'm doing. It. I'm doing it for the guys and girls who are wrestling that, that, that maybe lead that little help at the end of their career. Mm-hmm. Hey, man, pay for their insurance or pay a stipend to them for their insurance. Be so, like, you know, yeah. I know as a Canadian moving to the States, that's a kick in the butt knowing oh, I have boy. to pay for health insurance. Yeah. Mind you, the weight, I hurt my knee on like a Saturday, had to had to check up on Monday and surgery by Wednesday. So it definitely happens quicker in the States, but that 1500 bucks a month is just like... Oh, it's brutal. Uh, yeah, look, we my, got, mine's about there that two yeah, for three We people, got a few minutes. I, Animal, I just want to ask you to share your thoughts about your former partner who passed away, Hawk, and mm-hmm. tell everybody what type of person he was. And then maybe you both could tell everybody where you're going to be this weekend and uh, so they can catch you. Sure. Well, you know, Hawk was uh, talk about someone in the business that was a man's man. Hawk was a man's man. Hawk didn't pull any punches. Um, what you saw is what you got. But he was also the guy, I'll never forget, when we were doing a shoot in Manhattan. And we walked by and there's this wino coming up. We were coming up like a 23 station, you know, from on the subway. There's this wide old sitting there, and he's down and out with the Joneses and everything else. And he goes, "Hey, animal, give me a hundred bucks." I said, "Why?" He goes, "I'm going to give this guy a hundred dollars." So then we both gave him a hundred dollars, and the guy didn't know what to do. Mm. I'm sure he's going to go buy wine for the whole block. <laughs> hey, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but still, that, but that's the kind of guy Hawk was. He would give you the shirt off his back in an instant. He, he was the guy, he was like, we used to call him like Mr. Congeniality, like he was running for mayor all the time. You know what I mean? And uh, he, he, just a, he was a great human being, man. Did he have his demons and issues? Absolutely. He cost us making millions of dollars marketing-wise mm-hmm. of merchandise, man, millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Probably why I'm still doing appearances today. You know, because you know, every time he got suspended, there I was getting suspended, you know, and then when he died, Unexpectedly, it was like, holy crap, now what am I going to do? You know, well, they gave they, you Heidenreich, right? Yeah, then they gave me Heidenreich, yeah, which Heidenreich. was the same as Hawk. Yeah. yeah. Or worse. Really? Oh, brother. Holy They cow. found him passed out on the New York Thruway, bleeding from his ears one time. <sighs> what does that wow. tell you what he was doing, man? Your sinus is that bad, oh you're bleeding God. from your ears. Yeah, man. So when all that happened, it was just like, you know, eh, yeah. But yeah, man, he, he, he was a great guy. And, and I did the hide and right thing because the LOD stuff was still selling so strong merchandise wise. They wanted to keep that train going because that was going really well. And they were probably paying me off the merchandise. Were you torn by that though? Like, man. Yeah, know. yeah, because it's hard. Listen, I don't have my guy anymore. There's only going to be run one yeah. way, man. And one that had to be rough. Right. Man. You're never going to be able to redo it. But it was. A get way for me to keep feeding my family, man, and paying the Fair bills enough. and stuff like that. So, in that aspect, it was it was it was great, man. So it's mm-hmm. you know, it was a sad day when he died, man. I'll never forget it, man. I was living in uh, right outside of Minneapolis at the time, and I'm vacuuming my pool out there and enjoying a nice, beautiful Sunday. And 
There's a friend of mine, Bobby Muller, and the guy from Brooklyn is a photographer. And he used to work for G George Napolitano. And uh, he says, Joe, how you doing? I'm good, man. He goes, have you heard from Mike lately? He said, yeah, he called me last night about 1 o'clock in the morning. He was still moving. So he was moving from his condo into a house. Mm -hmm. Because the condo, you get sandblasted on St. Pete. Like, takes all the paint off everything. So he goes, I'm going to move my stuff in the house for my wife. And he goes, huh, you talked to him today? And I said, no, I didn't. And it's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He goes, Mike died last night. I said, what? And that's how I found out, man. I sat on a, my deck and I cried like a freaking baby. I mean, that's, I was with Hawk more than I was with my family and my wife. Of course. We were together for 21 years, 22 years, man. Every day, pretty much. Was he more of a brother to you than oh, your actual yeah, brothers? Oh, yeah, he probably really was. You know, my brother Mark and I were pretty close with definitely more than Johnny and I. Mm. You know, I mean, I mean, I was with Hawk through thick and thin through everything. You know, when he had uh, Hep C, I was right there when he's going through the interferon treatments. You know, when he got, you know, everything else, I always forgave him for all the super stuff. When, when uh, he got so messed up and he took off and he went to Japan and started working with Kensuke Sasaki, yeah, did that angle with Kensuke. And I said, all right, you know, good thing, man. I was a smart businessman. I had Lloyd's of London. I said, okay, bro. I broke my back. I might as well collect my Lloyds. Mm. Although I could feel pretty healthy medically on film, I'm messed up. Yeah. Because we have so much spurs in our body and our spine, you don't realize how many spurs you got until you take a picture of it. And you usually go, what the heck? How am I even moving? You know, you're like an arthritic spore walking around. Mm. You know, but you know, yeah, man, it's so, it's, it is what it is, man. I miss the guy. I miss him. If he were alive today, brother, we would be killing these appearances together. Oh, what it was was the greatest run yeah. in the history of tag team wrestling. That's what that was. All right, uh, so Warriors. speaking of appearances, where are you guys uh, going to be seen in this uh, big weekend for well, professional evening, wrestling? We're at uh, Standalone Wrestling. Mm -hmm. okay. Friday we'll be, Night Fights, right? Friday yeah, night Friday Night Fights, fights yeah. for Standalone Wrestling. And Mike, are you wrestling in? Uh, yes. Look at I'm that. Be wrestling tonight. Nice. Yeah, who are you pounding then, down? I mean, <laughs> who? <laughs> who <laughs> sir, so who's it? Serpentillo or I something? I, I forget. <laughs> to be honest. And that's no disrespect to him. I, 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 so much, I, see, I see so many announcements on matches, Puma I get them King. all mixed up. Is it Puma, but, uh, King? Puma King? Puma King's in every event. <laughs> and then on Saturday, sure you guys so? are at the big event? Yeah, the big, big event. event yeah. And then okay. Wrestle Pro at night. Excellent. Yeah, man. And speaking of the big event, that's uh, what, 8 to 3 p.m. And Monty Nefaro will be with Village Connection over with our own J.J. McGuire, who will be... Selling his new book, My Life in Heaven Town, right? Uh, stories from a composer and historian and an icon to professional wrestling. And I want to thank the great Hall of Famer Animal and the hey, you're future man. You're WWE welcome. You're welcome. star Mike Elgin joining us. I want uh, Bart from Wisteria Hall to send us out along with the great J.J. McGuire. Great. Say it. Say your theme. Give us a rush. Who, me? You. Okay, let's see if I can do Hawks thing justice, man. <laughs> oh, what a rush! <laughs> Thank you.